I am Chris Thomas. I am a lawyer in Portland. Um, I am a, a personal injury lawyer, um, which means that I represent people after they've been um, hurt in a variety of ways. But our law firm um, has a long history of, of representing people who are injured while bicycling or walking. And um, as part of that, uh, we have a sort of unique view on the ways that people are impacted when something really awful happens to them, um, because part of our job is to tell their story to a, um, a, a jury, potentially, hearing their case. Um, and so we, unfortunately, um, see a lot of the ramifications when things go wrong out on our roadways. And we see it a lot of times how collisions happen. Um, and we think that that gives us a helpful perspective in the advocacy world um, in terms of uh, helping to improve the laws, to make the roads safer, um, try to improve the infrastructure, um, and educating people about what their rights and responsibilities are out on the roadway. Um, and the law firm, uh, Thomas Kuhn, Newton Frost, um, my, my father, Ray Thomas, was one of the founders back in 1980. He's been involved in uh, bicycle and pedestrian advocacy for many years, as have other lawyers from our law firm. Um, and we've had a partnership with many um, cycling and pedestrian safety uh, nonprofits um, during that time. And we're um, really happy to be partnering up with Commute Options for, for this talk. Um, and to tell you a little bit um, about me personally, uh, I, uh, as, as Whitney mentioned, grew up in Portland. I've been uh, commuting by bike, racing bikes, and since I had kids, uh, trying to get my, my kids around by bike, um, I've got an electric cargo bike that I use to drop kids off at uh, school in the morning. Um, and I regularly ride with kids, my eight-year-old and um, seven-year-old on their own bikes. And it is really a vulnerable feeling to be riding around among cars on the streets with young kids. Uh, which really hits home why why we do this work of trying to make our streets safer, um, help educate people about what the rules are. So um, my hope for today is to talk about um, the current state of uh, Oregon e-bike law so that we're all um, aware of the rules um, and then also to talk about um, how it is that because of the rapid rise of e-bikes um, everywhere, and including and especially, I think, in Bend, um, the rules have not quite kept up uh, with what is actually happening out there. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities for improvement. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. And um, my hope is that this can really be a dialogue. And so please feel free to chime in with questions along the way by um, raising your hand or um, you know, how, maybe in the chat. And if I fail to see a question, hopefully someone can help bring it to my attention. Um, so with that, um, I wanna share my screen so that I can show you a few things that I um, have prepared. So this is um, our law firm, and you can see that there's a website here, OregonBikeLaw.com, um, which has some really handy written resources about bike law, e-bike law in particular. Um, and so if you're interested in some um, materials, written materials about bike and pedestrian law, uh, this is a good place to look. Um, first, just uh, like I mentioned, I wanted to show you guys a few uh, pictures of how I see and enjoy uh, using um, e-bikes. So this is just last weekend. Uh, we've got a baby and uh, we went to the park. And these are two of my kids here and a, our little baby. And it's pretty awesome to roll over to the neighborhood park with uh, a, an e-bike full of toys and kids. And uh, it's not something that I would ever have strong enough legs to do, if not for the 
the electric bike motor. Um, so it's just sort of a testament to the, the magic and efficiency of the e-bike. Um, this is a picture I, I wanted to include. This is my bike commute to work in, in Northeast Portland. This is a group of uh, middle schoolers biking to school. And this is really um, what it's all about uh, for people of this age um, who aren't old enough to drive uh, and have a fair amount of ground to cover. Um, it, I mean, bikes in general provide just so much uh, independence um, for people. And these are not e-bikes, the regular bikes. Um, this is a relatively dense neighborhood in, in Northeast Portland. Um, but I know that there is a strong desire uh, among kids um, in a variety of places, including Ben, to, to ride e-bikes uh, to get around uh, where maybe they've got more hills to, to traverse or, or more ground to cover. Um, and then last, I just wanted to include this picture. This is a recent family bike ride we did. And it was really possible because we had e-bikes in the mix. Uh, I'm riding my cargo bike. My mother-in-law is riding her e-bike. We've got the little kids on the e-bikes and the other kids riding their own bikes. And it's just um, a beautiful thing to be able to, to have a little extra help when you're, when you're hauling uh, all those people and their stuff. Um, big picture, e-bikes in, in, under Oregon law are really treated very similarly to regular bikes. So if you know what the rules of the road are as they relate to regular bikes, you know 90% um, of the rules of the road related to e-bikes. Um, there are a few exceptions, but what the rule, what the Oregon statute says is electric bikes are going to be treated like bikes unless the statute says that they shouldn't be. Um, so I think it's helpful to to go through some basic bicycle law so that we all are on the same page about what the, the laws are for e-bikes. Um, but first, um, I think it's helpful to talk about what legally is an e-bike. Um, we, we see a lot of different permutations out on the roads and in the shops that uh, are e-bikes of some variety, but not all of them are legally e-bikes under Oregon law. And uh, it's really important because it can be uh, a problem for people if they think they're riding an e-bike, but what they're actually riding is uh, a motorcycle or a moped or something else legally, and they didn't realize it. So um, an e-bike is, there's a definition under Oregon law of a bicycle. Uh, it's got to have a seat. It's got to have up to three wheels. It's got to have pedals. Um, and an e-bike is just that with a motor, an electric motor. And the motor has to um, not be too powerful. It can't be more than a thousand watts. And it can't um, power the bike more than 20 miles an hour on flat ground. So um, there is a sort of a, a speed and power limit on how big the e-bike motor can be for it to be an e-bike. Um, there is some interesting discussion around that because uh, some e-bike manufacturers take the position that, well, the bike can't go over 20 uh, no matter what. And for example, my, my cargo bike that I showed you a picture of has a hard governor at 20. You can't, you can't go above that. Um, other e-bike manufacturers take a different view of that rule um, and say, um, the 20 miles an hour is the, the speed attributable to the electric motor. You can go faster than that once you add your, your leg power on top of that, right? So if you're pedaling really hard and you got your motor all the way cranked up, if you're going, if you go 25 or 30, um, but only 20 miles per hour is attributable to your motor, then you're good. Um, though I think that the latter is probably the, the legally correct interpretation under Oregon law. But there is some ambiguity there. And if you ever try to go fast on a Shimano uh, electric bicycle system like I've got, uh, it's got a pretty um, strict governor at 20 miles an hour, um, which is fine because I'm just riding around with kids. Um, so that's, that's the legal definition of an e-bike. 
uh, for it to be an electric bicycle under Oregon law and be treated as a bicycle, uh, as I've talked about. Um, a lot of times, e-bikes sold at shops in Oregon have more power than that. And that raises an interesting issue of um, what happens if those people are riding around uh, and they get in a crash or they get pulled over and their bike, their e-bike is deemed not legally an e-bike, but in fact, a moped or a motorcycle because of the amount of power it's got. Um, are they going to be found liable in a collision that they're involved in? Or are they going to um, be cited for failing to have a license or insurance? Um, those are issues that arise when you've got this vehicle that is sort of um, in this gray area between being a motor vehicle and a bicycle. And the, um, the fact that the Oregon standard for what an e-bike is, is um, somewhat more restrictive than you see across the industry means that there are likely a lot of e-bikes being ridden in Oregon that are not legally e-bikes, but that their um, owners don't realize that, that that's the case. Um, I had a guy call me uh, who got a ticket for driving unlicensed on an e-bike. He thought it was an e-bike. He had had his license suspended for some reason. And the um, Oregon State Trooper who issued him the ticket said, this guy's e-bike was too powerful, so it wasn't an e-bike. And um, this guy thought that he was totally in the clear legally, but um, the equipment he was riding was apparently too powerful. Um, e-bikes under Oregon law have to have pedals, but they can also have a throttle. Um, you may have heard of the three class system. That's not something that Oregon law recognizes. So we have um, e-bikes have to have pedals. They can have a throttle on top of that. Um, sometimes the pedals seem like kind of an afterthought uh, on some bikes that are more intended apparently for use as uh, used with the throttle, but they're all supposed to have pedals that um, are part of how they function. There is an age requirement for e-bikes. You have to be 16 years old or older in Oregon to legally operate an electric bike. I know that is um, a rule that is frequently broken by teenagers who um, want to ride e-bikes to get around. Um, and that I think is rightfully the subject of some um, advocacy efforts to, to update. Um, okay, I want to go through just some basic bicycle rules of the road so that uh, we have a refresher on some things that um, are, are rules of the road that all bicycles are subject to, not just e-bikes. Okay, so this is a, a summary of Oregon bike law that our law firm uh, puts together and sends out to bike shops so that they've got sort of a wallet-sized card of uh, what... Oregon bike law is, and it, it's all pretty well summarized here. Um, and I'm not going to read every word, but I'll just to kind of go over it. So this first section says that uh, on a bike, you're allowed to take the lane uh, and in fact, ride two abreast if you're not impeding the normal movement of traffic. So if you're, if you're keeping up with traffic under Oregon law, uh, you are allowed to take the lane. Um, if you're riding at less than the normal speed of traffic, then you have to ride as far to the right as practical. Or on a one-way street, you can ride as far to the left as practical. There are exceptions to this um, requirement to ride as far to the right to the left as practical. They're kind of what you would think if you're passing somebody, if you're avoiding debris, if you're making a left turn. Um, and then... Uh, of course, if you're on a street with a bike lane, um, then you are required to use the bike lane. You can't, you can't take the lane on those streets. Um, sidewalks. Now, this, this relates to bikes. So bikes are allowed to ride on the sidewalk uh, in Oregon unless prohibited by a local ordinance. 
And this is one important area of distinction with e-bikes. E-bikes are specifically not allowed to ride on the sidewalk anywhere in Oregon. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're dropping your kid off at school. Uh, there is not an exception for, for things like that. It's, it's prohibited. Um, bicyclists are required to, uh, when riding on the sidewalk, yield to pedestrians and give an audible warning when passing. Um, they are also uh, required to, as all vehicles are, at an unmarked intersection, yield to the vehicle approaching on the right. Um, this is a big one. Motorists must yield to bicyclists in bike lanes and in crosswalks and on sidewalks. Um, this first part, motorists must yield to bicyclists in bike lanes. If that rule were followed, uh, we would have half as many cases involving injured bicyclists because the vast majority of our cases are called right or left hook collisions where people turn across bike lanes without yielding to bicyclists as you're required to under the law. Um, passing, Oregon has what's called a safe passing law for bicyclists. So if you're riding on a road um, and you are passed at more than 35 miles per hour, then the driver is required to give you enough room to fall over to your left without getting hit. Uh, this applies on a lot of uh, rural roads, two lane roads where people like to ride. And when you're passing in those areas, uh, when you're passing a bicyclist, you got to give them, you know, five or six feet, however tall they are, enough room to fall over without getting uh, hit. Um, bike lanes. If there's a bike lane um, under Oregon law, uh, the bicyclist has to use it unless there's a hazard in the bike lane um, or if they're getting ready to turn left in the bike lanes on the right hand side of the street. That's called a mandatory side path law, and that is the current state of law in Oregon. Speed on a bicycle, um, same as in a motor vehicle, um, except if you are. Um, Riding on the sidewalk, which again, you can't do on an e-bike, but you can on a regular bike in, in a lot of places. Um, if you ride on the sidewalk on a bicycle, you're required to slow down to an ordinary walking speed when you are approaching a crosswalk or crossing a driveway. Um, so that's a big, important one because there are a lot of places where people don't feel safe riding in the street. Um, or they want to ride on the sidewalk for some other reason. And um, legally, they're required to slow down to a walking speed before they cross a driveway or enter a crosswalk. And that's because people driving um, aren't necessarily looking for people entering a crosswalk or crossing a driveway at a higher rate of speed. Uh, yes, Whitney? I was going to jump in and ask a question here, Chris, because I actually had something um, sent to me from a, from uh, one of our council members on this specific uh, statute about the speed. And specifically, his question was, he was wondering if you have to go walking speed when approaching a crosswalk, but what about when you're actually in the crosswalk? Can you then speed up to max? Yeah, yeah so the, um, the statute says entering when entering the crosswalk. And um, so whether you can, so it doesn't address whether after entering you can speed up. Um, so there's no uh, statutory requirement that you maintain a walking speed throughout the entire crosswalk. But I, I should say that there are all these rules in our statutes, but then on top of that, there's something called reasonable care that we have a duty to do at all times. And that's outside of what the statutes say. And if you fail to use reasonable care and somebody gets hurt, then that's what that's called negligence. And even though there wasn't necessarily a statute broken, if you failed to use reasonable care and, and got hurt or hurt somebody else, then you can be deemed negligent. And so it could be that depending on the circumstances, going faster than a walking speed after entering the crosswalk would be deemed, you know, unreasonable. Um, but that is a very fact intensive question. Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, sure. Um, lighting on a bike, uh, you're required to, in limited visibility conditions, to have a white light to the front and a red reflector or a light to the rear. Um, and you're required to indicate your intention to turn or stop on a bike um, by using a hand signal for 100 feet before doing so. Unless, importantly, because this is a this exception applies a lot, unless the circumstances require that both hands be used to safely control the bicycle. So if you're riding downhill and you're about to turn, um, you you may not feel comfortable while braking and going downhill taking your hand off the handlebar to signal. And if that's the case, then you're not required to signal. But a lot of times what I try to do in that situation is to at least signal briefly if I can if not for a full 100 feet. Uh, helmets are required by law for riders under 16 years of age. And so um, this applies to, to e-bikes as well um, for passengers. Uh, and obviously you're supposed to be 16 or older to operate an e-bike. And so technically the helmet requirement does not apply to legal operators of e-bikes. Okay, so that's a fair, there's a fair amount there. That whole summary of bike law is on our Oregon Bike Law um, website, and it's also in the presentation materials, which I would be happy to send folks if they like them. Um, and pretty much everything there that we talked about applies to e-bikes, um, except for you can't ride on the sidewalk, and uh, you've got to be uh, 16 or older to ride. Um, Chris, we have a couple questions in the chat that just popped in there. Oh, great. Um, right. So bike crosswalks, the new green ones, is that a crosswalk covered by 814? Um, thank you, Robin, for that question. Um, the, the, um, the question is about the green, what they sometimes call cross bikes. Uh, which are paint on the ground that's kind of zebra striped and kind of looks like a crosswalk, but it's green. And the ones that I have seen here in Portland um, have really no legal significance at all. Um, they are designed to bring attention to the fact that people are crossing um, the road at that location on a bike. But um, generally, the people crossing on a bike at those locations face a stop sign. And um, the fact that there's green paint on the ground just past the stop sign doesn't give them any additional rights. And in Portland, what happens is um, a lot of times people see those green stripes and they slow down and stop so that people riding bikes can cross. But they're not legally required to. Um, and so they're basically doing it as a courtesy or out of confusion about what the legal rights are. Um, and I've always been worried that those green stripes, while well-intentioned, create ambiguity that could create a, a problem. And in fact, um, I've had a car stop for me at one of those green stripe crossings. When I had a stop sign, they didn't. Um, they stopped so aggressively that the car behind them had to skid to a stop and almost hit them. And uh, it raised sort of an interesting legal question about, well, if there had been a collision there, uh, you know, I think pretty clearly the person who stopped when they didn't have to would bear some liability for that. Um, so uh, the legal ambiguity of those works in my favor every day on my bike commute um, because people stop for me when they don't have to, and I appreciate it. Um, but um, but they're not legally required to stop for you at those green cross bikes. Um, in contrast, at a crosswalk, if you are a bicyclist and you're allowed to ride on the sidewalk and you get to the corner and you want to cross in a crosswalk, which is something that connects the sidewalk on both sides of the street, then um, as long as you uh, indicate your intention to proceed, and or enter at a walking speed, um, drivers are required to stop for you while you're on your bike in a crosswalk. Um, so 
that's a very important legal distinction between so-called cross bikes and crosswalks. And Megan mentioned, uh, we just learned the, the walking speed before the crosswalk law. It's very helpful. I agree. Unfortunately, we've talked to a lot of people who didn't know that rule and got in a collision and um, wish that they had known about that because it does feel like a little bit of a trap legally if you don't know about it. All right. Um, so moving along from rules of the road, I want to talk about um, bikes and insurance. So um, a lot of people don't realize this, but when you are riding your bike or walking around uh, town, you have auto, and, and, and if you have auto insurance, um, then even though your car is at home in your driveway, you are protected by your auto insurance against the risk of being hit by a negligent driver. And that um, manifests in a couple of different ways. One is that there's coverage under your auto insurance called PIP that pays for medical expenses and lost income. Um, another is there's coverage called uninsured motorist coverage, where if the person who hit you doesn't have enough insurance to pay for all your damages, then you can actually make a claim against your own auto insurance for damages that you can prove that the driver doesn't have insurance for. So in Oregon, Oregon law says drivers have to carry bodily injury insurance in case they hurt somebody of $25,000. That's the minimum amount required. And if you seriously injure somebody, $25,000 doesn't even cover like, you know, a night in the hospital. Um, and so there are the, the legally required amount of insurance is woefully inadequate in a lot of collisions, serious injury collisions. And so it's really helpful to look at your own auto insurance if you have a car um, and look at the amount of coverage you've got for uninsured motorist coverage and for personal injury protection hip coverage and see if you can um, see if you have enough coverage. It's pretty unfortunate that we have to insure ourselves against the risk of somebody else doing something irresponsible. But um, because the insurance minimums are so low, that's, that's the world we live in. And most of our clients come to us after they've been hurt and they have no idea what their limits are. And a lot of times they don't even, they don't realize that their auto insurance would apply at all. Um, it's a little counterintuitive, but it does. Unfortunately, people who don't, unfortunately, people who do not have auto insurance um, don't have that benefit and are a little bit more dependent on uh, whatever coverage the driver might have. Um, and then, you know, health insurance and, you know, disability insurance or whatever else they might have, uh, have bought separately. Um, so generally bicyclists and pedestrians are subject to getting that coverage from their auto insurance. When you add an electric motor to a bike, um, it raises the question of, is this now no longer a bicycle? Is it now a motor vehicle? Um, for purposes of those coverages. And if you have a motor vehicle um, that you own and use, and you don't list it on your auto insurance policy, then your, your insurance company might say, well, um, this is not a covered vehicle because you, you should have put it on your policy. Um, fortunately, I have never seen an auto insurer deny coverage to an e-bike rider because they're on an e-bike. Every, every case I've had, auto insurers have covered e-bikes just as if they were bicycles, um, which is, is helpful and good. Um, I do worry though about um, a situation where, for example, someone is riding a higher powered e-bike, like we talked about earlier, uh, and they don't, they don't get coverage from their auto insurer. And this is just one of those areas where, um, because of the rapid rise in uh, e-bike use, we're seeing more and more, you know, cases where this can, this whole thing can be tested and 
Um, but fortunately, um, I haven't seen a, an issue where e-bikes have been denied coverage, but it is something to, to kind of keep an eye on. And I think the bottom line for, for bicyclists is uh, to take a look at your auto insurance and, and add coverage if, if you need to, to, to have a decent amount. Chris, Heidi had a question about just repeating the additional coverage. What was it called oh, sure. again? Yeah, um, uninsured motorist and then personal injury protection. It's kind of a mouthful, but it's often called PIP, P-I-P. Another uh, thing I'll mention about insurance is that the vast majority of collisions we see are between uh, bicycles and motor vehicles. Uh, I should say collisions involving bicycles. Uh, it's almost always a, between a bike and a car. Um, but we've had a couple of cases over the years of collisions between bikes and pedestrians or bikes and bikes, bike on bike. Um, in collisions between bikes or between a bike and a person walking, there's no motor vehicle involved. And so there's no auto insurance coverage. And um, in those cases, what can happen is if there's a negligent bicyclist who gets sued, uh, there's a claim that's opened with their homeowner's insurance, and there there is often homeowner's insurance coverage uh, to cover that kind of um, liability. That's non-automobile liability. Again, that's a, a very remote uh, type of collision that results in serious injury that as far as our office sees or that I've heard about but it does happen and um, that's the kind of coverage that would kick in. Um, another thing that I wanna talk about is um, shared use paths. So um, in Portland, for example, um, our shared use paths through downtown Portland on the riverfront and um, in other parts of the city um, are in city parks. And there is a city of Portland ordinance that says you can't operate a motor vehicle in a park. And so technically, um, some of Portland's best uh, bicycle routes, um, Springwater Corridor, Waterfront Park, um, East Side Esplanade, you're not allowed to ride an e-bike in those, in those places under the law. And um, it's never enforced. Nobody really even knows about it. Um, but it is sort of an indication of when the, when these ordinances were written, it was maybe 20, 30 years ago or more when e-bikes were either not a thing or barely a thing. And now they're everywhere. And um, it hasn't been a policy priority to update and correct these statutes. Um, but there are remnants of that sort of previous era uh, in really important bike infrastructure in Portland. Um, and I know that a similar thing came up a few years ago in Oregon State Parks um, where they found a similar rule that prohibited motor vehicles in, in Oregon Parks. Uh, and then once it was on the radar of the, the parks uh, agency, they changed it to allow for e-bikes with, I think, some reasonable restrictions if, if it's like a narrow trail or something. Um, I, I'm not um, aware of any comparable rule on um, Bend City Parks, um, but I haven't looked into it. Um, and hopefully it's not an issue. Um, but it's, you know, there's a variety of rules that govern these recreational spaces and um, understandably they restrict motor vehicle use. And if, if that, if they don't address e-bikes and it's just motor vehicles are prohibited, then you may see that those sorts of exclusions, which seem like they need to be fine tuned in light of, you know, where we are now. Um, all right, so that is kind of my overview of um, e-bike law. Um, and now I would like to, um, oh, I see that there's a question. Um, 
from Heidi, can you speak to how adopting an e-bike classification system in Oregon can affect laws or consequences? Yeah, so um, the, for those who aren't familiar, there is a, a number of states um, and a national effort to um, have a three-class system for e-bikes. Um, class one and class two e-bikes are limited to 20 miles an hour. Um, class one e-bikes don't have a throttle, class two e-bikes do. Um, and then class three e-bikes can go up to 28 miles an hour. I think I've got that right. Um, in Oregon, we don't have that. Um, in Oregon, uh, class three e-bikes, if they've got, you know, a, a powerful motor that can power them faster than 20 miles an hour, those wouldn't be e-bikes. And um, so if we were to, and I know there have been some efforts led by, I think, uh, People for Bikes to change Oregon bike law to impose the three-class system. And um, they didn't, they, they weren't successful, I think, a couple years ago. Um, and I'm not sure, um, I think that the view was, I mean, for one thing, right now it's it's pretty simple, right? Um, electric assisted bikes are treated as bikes, so they can use bike lanes, they can do everything bikes can. And part of the um, justification for that is that they've got this, this speed limit, this power limit on them. And that's why I think we're comfortable allowing our current definition of e-bikes to use bike facilities. If you embrace the three class system, then it would raise a question of, I think, um, do we need to explicitly prohibit faster e-bikes, class three e-bikes from certain facilities because they're too fast? Um, that would open up the, the need for doing work. You know, we talked about um, Oregon State Parks and the city of Portland Parks. And do we want to have, do we want to allow some of those classes to use bike lanes, for example, but not others? Um, I, I'm not sure the precise reason why bringing the three class system into Oregon wasn't successful the last time around, um, but it does seem like it would have the benefit of creating some standardization and some, you know, uniformity for retailers in particular and for consumers. Um, but it is, it would require a fair amount of work, I think, to update Oregon laws to match up so that, uh, you know, in recognition of the fact that now we've got so many bikes that can go 28 that are legal. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if we were headed, headed that way. Um, and Megan asked, um, mentioned that she just updated her auto policy. Um, that was fast. And, uh, and then asked about coverage for kids riding bikes under an auto policy. Um, that's a good question. And separately, trying to use the proliferation of e-bikes to convince Hood River leadership. Well, let's start with the first question. So if your kid's riding a bike and they are um, in a collision with a car, um, then does your auto insurance protect them? That's a great question. But generally, the way it works is under an auto policy, it says these are people who are named insured, so are listed as insured under this policy. And then it also says, these are people who are also covered by this policy. And it generally includes family members who live in the same house. So generally speaking, if you have a family member who lives in the same house as you, whether they drive or not, whether they're old enough to drive or not, they're covered under your auto policy. And I would expect that that would be the result. Um, and whether they're a pedestrian or a bicyclist or a passenger, um, you know, uh, you know, on a bike or in a car. So I think I think they're they're going to be covered. Um, and then Megan says separately, I'm trying to use the prolif proliferation of e-bikes to convince Hood River leadership to have consistent designs 
with protected bike lanes and walking space. Earth is shared use paths. Is there any legal backing for this argument? Um, yeah, I think you know that's that's something that um, that we should talk about. And I so one of the things that's happened with the proliferation of e-bikes is um, there's a lot more demand for safe places to ride, and a lot more potential conflict between different path users. And so e-bikes and bikes and pedestrians and joggers and rollerbladers and everybody else is often trying to use the same infrastructure. And when you have a ton more people trying to use limited infrastructure, um, it creates issues. So um, I don't know that there is a legal backing for the argument as much as a policy backing um, to say that you know, the, all these opportunities for conflicts between different road users or path users means we need more space. Um, and I was really, um, I was in Chicago a few years ago and really liked what they'd done along the Lakeshore Drive where they've got a, a walking path and parallel to it, they've got a biking path and there's just plenty of space and way less conflict than you would see if they were all, you know, in the same space. Um, so I think I think it's it's really important that we recognize that with this increased popularity comes a ton of increased demand for safe places to ride, and um, a lot of times what you see is people don't feel safe riding on certain um, predominantly car infrastructure, and so they end up riding on the sidewalk or um, you know on a path that's already busy. And it just creates a lot of, it can create a lot of conflict. All right. Um, so now I wanna talk uh, a little bit more about some of the, this, just what, what we talked about um, a moment ago, which is um, some of the issues that have arisen um, because of this surge in popularity. And I can say personally that um, in the last three years, the number of people I know who have bought e-bikes I think is in this like several dozen, um, a ton of my neighbors, family members, people who never considered themselves cyclists uh, now have e-bikes and they're like cruising around with their kids. And it's really, really pretty cool to see. Um, but it does come with issues. And um, one of the things that we, we talked about is, um, is, kids who are not legally allowed to ride e-bikes who are. And um, I know that um, that that has been an issue um, that's been uh, given a lot of attention recently in Bend um, and elsewhere. I've got family down in uh, Encinitas, California, at Surf Town, and they say that they're, they're kids who are, you know, cruising around on, on e-bikes with their surfboards and there's a lot of hills and um, it's, it's, I think it's really understandable that kids would want to ride e-bikes, especially in places where there are hills or that are more spread out, um, because they want to cover ground. They want to be independent. They don't have a car yet, or they can't drive yet, or they don't want a car. Um, so the problem with kids not being legally allowed to ride e-bikes is, um, you know, obviously they could get a ticket from a police officer, but also if they got in a crash, um, there would be an argument, even if they weren't at fault, um, that they shouldn't have been riding an e-bike in the first place. And that could be used against them when deciding who's at fault. Um, Mark, Mark Johnson pointed out, he was reading today that e-bikes in global circulation have gone up 50% since just 2019. And uh, that's, certainly consistent with, with what I feel like I've seen. Um, so, you know, uh, I think, I don't think the answer can be um, how to like, just say kids can't legally ride e-bikes. I've seen a proposal from uh, a Bend uh, state legislator, uh, Emerson Levy, to um, open, allow kids to ride e-bikes that are not of the throttle variety, um, which could be one way to address it. 
Um, and, but I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, um, anytime you add another rule like this, you create the potential where, um, well, first of all, you got to enforce it. And then you have also the, the issue of retailers and the lack of uniformity. And so it, it just, it just creates a lot of questions, but, um, I, I happen to live in a neighborhood where things are relatively dense. There's not a lot of hills and I don't see the proliferation of kids on e-bikes um, as much as other places do, I think. Um, but um, I certainly hope that we can find a solution to that that is not just, you know, kids can't ride them because I know in a lot of places uh, that's a really appealing option if done uh, safely. Yeah, I think, you know, it's anytime you have a big, um, a big surge in popularity of a new technology, I think big picture that we should be really um, celebrating the fact that we've got this really great and efficient new technology that is so popular and that has the potential to get people active with their kids and people who are um, not as comfortable riding a regular bike um, for whatever reason getting people out riding who wouldn't otherwise be riding. I think that that is a really cool thing. And it's the problem we have now is how do we, how do we address issues created by this surge in demand of a really cool thing? So it's, it's really a great problem to have. Um, and I know that Ben, I mean, I was talking with, uh, with Whitney and with Brian about Bend as a, as a leader in the state of Oregon, uh, for e-bike policy. And I think to me, it seems like it's gotta be one of the places with the highest per capita use of e-bikes in the state. Um, and um, so there's really an opportunity, I think, to, to bring the Oregon um, statutory scheme into um, you know where it should be based on where we are with e-bikes. And I know that there's a lot of discussion happening there uh, with leaders out of Bend helping uh, lead that discussion so um but i i hope that um i hope that today has been helpful to kind of understand where we're at now some of the issues that it creates uh given the the really big increased demand on facilities and um some of the inconsistencies between what the law says and and what's being done in practice um so Let's see, there are a couple other comments. Um, Megan uh, had a nice comment. Uh, thank you, Megan, for your positive feedback. And um, I would I would be happy to to talk with other other folks about uh, e-bike law. And um, and then Kim asked, how can the community help increase safety for kids under 16 without limiting mobility for families? Kind of a tricky one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough. We're going to have to find the right balance. Um, does anyone have any other questions for me? Well, I would be happy to share um, my materials today, I should mention that in addition to what I showed you, and actually, let me just show you guys real quick uh, some more materials that I've got, um, and then I can offer to send these to you. This is um, a table that's got a ton of stuff on it, but this is put out by the state of Oregon, and it compares different types of uh, electric vehicles and motor vehicles and licensing requirements and insurance requirements. And included on here is e-bikes and segways. So this is in materials that I've got that I can send to you if you'd like. I think it's pretty handy. Um, and then the last thing here is a book that we put together called Oregon e-bike rights. It's like 40 pages and it talks about some of these things in some more depth. So feel, feel free to reach out to me or to Whitney if you'd like um, copies of this stuff. Yeah, I think we'll send a follow out email with with all of those resources connected. So anybody on the call will, will be able to access that. 
I had a couple of questions too, just kind of since we have a little bit of time. One of the things that had come up about the e-bike, the law that says that e-bikes can ri cannot ride on sidewalks. Um, um, there's some curiosity as to really what defines a sidewalk and compared to a multi-use trail, is it based on the width or the, the specific infrastructure it's connected to? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so there is no statewide legal definition of a multi-use path. Um, generally, things are either sidewalks or bicycle paths. And um, it's kind of unfortunate because a lot of the paths that we have don't really neatly fall under one of those definitions. So, for example, a, a legal definition of a sidewalk is, you know, edge of the roadway, the area between the edge of the roadway to the adjacent property line for use by pedestri pedestrians. Um, and there is one of my favorite bike rides in Portland is out to Kelly Point. It's a big flat loop. And there's this great um, path that separates you from car traffic on that loop. And a whole bunch of it is actually sidewalk legally, but it feels like a multi-use path. And I think you could say the same thing of the Spring Water Corridor um, over in Southeast Portland. A bunch of sections of that are between a road and a property line, and it looks just like a sidewalk, but people don't necessarily think that they're on the sidewalk when they're using it. And that is relevant, not just because e-bikes could be prohibited from using it, but also because every time you cross a driveway or enter a crosswalk on that path, you're required to slow down to a walking speed, which people might not think is intuitive. So, um, so yeah, that, that ambiguity about what something is legally can create a lot of issues. And is there any, I guess this, there's another question that kind of was linked to that. Is there any movement into how that could be clarified in the law? Like it, I specifically, um, one of the questions was there's things like speed bumps and raised crosswalks that would help to clarify right of way and different things. But is there anything that are updates coming in the law that might be coming down the pipelines that could help? Yeah, you know, it's tough because, um, you know, for example, trying to change the requirement that people slow to a walking speed on a path, um, I think there would be some um, justifiable um, hesitation to do that because if you're driving and you're getting ready to cross um, a, a crosswalk of a high volume multi-use path, um, you don't, it's not necessarily reasonable to say that you don't have to slow down to a walking speed. Tough sell, I think, politically to say. Some places are should have different standards than others. So there's sort of this push for uniformity about some of that at the expense of getting it just right for every situation. Um, and I don't know about you guys, I, there's this place in Southeast Portland called the Trolley Trail, which is like an old rails to trails route, and it's great. But there's a stop sign at every crossing, and it's really hard to like maintain any momentum, and it can be kind of frustrating. Um, I think you know one way. It, this is sort of uh, maybe on a case by case basis, but um, instead of imposing on the the trail user the duty to slow down and stop, giving auto traffic stop signs or putting a signal in or doing something that would more sort of fairly allocate the right of way at those crossings. That's kind of, that, that's just one idea, but it's kind of on a, on a site by site case specific basis. Uh, I'm not aware of like any bigger efforts to add a multi-use path uh, legal definition that would solve a lot of those problems. I think they're just sort of, some of them are inherent in having places where bike infrastructure crosses, you know, a bunch of roads. Yeah, that helps. There's a question from um, 
There's a couple comments in the in the comment, and we have it until everyone that's on. We I know it's been it's been an hour. We did uh, this is till six thirty, so this is kind of this open conversation forum. So you're welcome to ask any questions that do come up. But we got a couple um, a comment from Lloyd, and then a, a question from Janet, Chris, if you want to. Oh sure, yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah, great. So Lloyd said, I just returned from Europe where electric scooters outnumber e-bikes. How does Oregon handle electric scooters? Um, that is a good question. There are a ton of statutes that are expressly directed at um, electric scooters. And we have actually written an e-scooter legal guide Kind of like our e-bike legal guide that addresses a bunch of those e-scooter specific um, rules and uh, one of the big ones is um, not riding on sidewalks and um, you know that is obviously something that uh, is not complied with very much here in downtown portland um and let's see there are a number of um rules about if you're on an e-scooter um can you ride in the lane or do you have to use a bike lane and because they're somewhat lower speed than e-bikes um there are some rules around them needing to use um you know not be in the street when there's like a bike facility um, so I don't I don't recall all the e-scooter rules offhand, um, but we do have a, an e-scooter legal guide on our OregonBikeLaw.com website, so I'd point you to that. Um, but um, the surge in popularity, I, I still see a bunch of people riding around on e-scooters um, in Portland. I tend to feel like the um, wheels are so small and the Handlebars are so narrow that I feel a little, um, I feel a little less uh, stable on e-scooters than I do on e-bikes, but they are fun. Um, so Janet asked, can local governments impose stricter rules than are in place at the state level? This has to be very useful. Um, yeah, so, you know, there is, a concept known as uh, preemption. So if the state regulates in an area, um, then the city can't come in and regulate in a different way um, that's inconsistent with the state regulation. But if the state if the city wants to impose a more um, stringent standard, then that is um, oftentimes allowed. And so um, there are examples of uh, cities, you know, restricting the use of riding bikes on sidewalks in their downtown core areas, regular bikes. Um, there are some Oregon cities where you're not allowed to ride with headphones on, um, on a bike. And um, that's not a statewide rule. So cities can come in and make more stringent rules um, depending on whether it's inconsistent with an existing state law or not. All right. Anybody? I have one more, I have one more question. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's so many questions. Um, what, you had talked about riding in the sidewalk and going walking speed. Um, we were talking about bikes. What about, I'm sorry, in the crosswalk, what about e-bikes operating the e-bike in the crosswalk? Is there anything the law like backs for that specifically? Well, so if you're not allowed to ride an e-bike on a sidewalk, then I guess there's still a question about whether you could ride one in a crosswalk. Um, for example, if there was a collision and the e-bike was in the crosswalk, well, the insurance company for the driver might say, well, they shouldn't have been in the crosswalk because they're not allowed on the sidewalk. Um, I'm not aware of any prohibition on riding an e-bike in a crosswalk. Um, the fact that they're not allowed to be on the sidewalk on either side of that street uh, could be, you know, used against them. But I, I don't know of any explicit prohibition on actually being in the crosswalk. 
Yeah, I, I think just to add to a little background on that question is that we have a lot of roundabouts in Bend mm -hmm. you know, and um, the sidewalks are kind of there's there there could be in some cases considered multi-use trails because of their width and how they're used and what they're connected to. And then they feed into a crosswalk. Mm -hmm. So there's that kind of ambiguity there of like, well, if that's like a multi-use trail, then then the crosswalk is a multi-use crosswalk <laughs> yeah yeah we we have that in portland in some places too where like uh um what is probably legally a bicycle path or a bicycle lane feeds into what uh looks like a crosswalk and um i think if it's if it's a crosswalk that is you know designed to connect um bicycle infrastructure um then um that is a little bit of a gray area legally because generally crosswalks connect, you know, the sidewalk to the sidewalk. But um, so it might be kind of a, a fact specific question about what is that infrastructure specifically. Um, there are a lot of new and interesting types of bike infrastructure around Portland that I see where kind of like the green cross bikes, you're like, it's it's well intentioned. It does bring attention to the crossing of bikes in this area. But um, if you do the legal analysis, what what rights does it actually provide? And a lot of times, it's not as clear cut as it could be. So, any other questions? And I should mention, um, we're our um, law firm is happy to try to do bike or e-bike uh, or pedestrian rights clinics. So if people ever have an interest in uh, having us do something like that, we're always happy to do it. Right. So this is more of this to come. Yeah. Great. Well, thank thank you all for having me. Um, please feel free to reach out with any questions that might come up later. And um, yeah, thanks again. Well, thank you, Chris, so much for being here. Thank you, everybody, for attending. We'll follow up with uh, email that has resources. And this has been recorded. So you can, we will share it, but we'll also have it up on our website connected to our e-bike education page, where we do have an e-bike online course that's a short quick test uh, or course you could take to learn a little bit fact of facts or test how much you remember from this webinar itself in there um and if that's it i think we can we can wrap it up and everyone can can join their continue on with their evening so thank you everybody so much commute options appreciates having everyone on board and ensuring that our our roads can just be a little bit safer for everyone to get to where they'd like to go